all will see how great, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Glad to see you today. Thanks for being here. And folks online, thank you for joining us. We appreciate that so very much. And I hope you're having a good morning there at the house or wherever you might be as you're watching. And I'll just go ahead and give a shout out to those who watch later, all right? Uh, so thank you very much for uh, making this a priority uh, in your schedule, in your life. And especially those who are here, thank you for uh, getting up and getting all purdied up and coming in and joining us for worship this morning. One of the special things about being a part of the Church of Nazarene is that we are an international church. Uh, we have, as you can see before you there, we have uh, churches, organized churches, in 164 world areas. Isn't that exciting? We have 531 full-time called missionaries. Uh, and then many volunteers and, and um, what do they call the temporary missionaries? The, they go for two Tent or three makers. years. Short -term. Tent makers. Tent makers. Short term, thank you. Uh, that's what I was looking for. Come on, Perry. It but used to be tent makers. It did used to be tent makers. That's, that's what Paul was. Anyway, um, so really pretty neat and, and awesome to be part of that. We also got volunteer. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I don't know if you, were, if you ever really think about it, um, the, the fact that uh, there are Christians as a direct result of the Church of Nazarene in 164 world areas, that is, that is amazing. And, and to attend General Assembly uh, that happens every four years and people from all over the world uh, come and worship together. Um, and there many have on headphones with translators uh, talking in their ears. Um, it, it's just an awesome thing. I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure exactly why it moves me so much to watch people uh, in other language groups praising the Lord, but it just it just stirs my heart. Uh, so we're gonna. There was a, a conference uh, earlier in 2021 called the Journey of Grace Conference. You can actually find that on YouTube. Uh, I think it was about a, a two-hour service. I, I don't remember really, but. Uh, great uh, it's there for you and it was a great time of worship and praise um, so I'm going to share with you a little snippet of that this is uh, one of the songs that was sung at that conference and uh, I hope it delights your heart David, can you pause that for just a second? Thank you. I meant to say something else. You see the little uh, map in the lower right-hand corner? Um, that's a map of the world. And every time a people group or a continent or, or a nation is featured, in other words, uh, not just somewhere in the video, but at that very moment, you'll watch the colors change on the map. It's pretty neat, so you can see where the people are from as they sing. All right, thank you. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth?
able to shout them. I can I can speak some um more. It can come. Can you help me up there? Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So anyways, I was saying before I was interrupted, <laughs> uh, I can speak some Mexican. <laughs> Taco, burrito, <laughs> fajita. <laughs> Mortimer, you are so silly. Hey, Green Pong, guess what? What, Mortimer? Well, I can do impersonation. Mortimer. Yeah, Grandpa? You can't do impersonation. Your voice is too weird. Grandpa, that's not a nice thing to say. Well, I didn't mean to hurt your feelings. I'm just saying you have, you have a certain kind of voice to do impersonations. But you go ahead and try if you think you can do it. Okay, here you go. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> I can do clean Eastwood too. Go ahead, make my day. I can write right poem. <laughs> yes, I can. Here we go. You want to hear one? Well, I guess that'd be all right. Y'all want to hear one? Yeah. Sure. Okay, here we go. Mary had a little lamb. He sleeps as white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Mortimer, you didn't write that. Well, I'm not finished yet, Grandpa. <clears throat> it followed her to church each week and went to Sunday school to hear the Bible stories and about the golden rule. <laughs> But one day up in Children's Church, I'm telling you the truth I am. It was terrified when Mortimer tried to ride that little lamb. <laughs> 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 well, that was pretty good, Mortimer. Well, thanks for your help, Grandpa. Anyway, well, it's good to see y'all. Yes, it is. Glad to see everybody here today. We'll check y'all later. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. <laughs> Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found Was blind But now I see Amazing grace How sweet the sound How sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me That saved a sinner A wretch, a sinner That saved a wretch like me I once was lost. I once was an addict. Heartbroken. Devastated. Ignored. Betrayed. Weak. Rejected. But now I'm found. But now I'm clean. Strong. I'm loved. I'm encouraged. I'm rescued. I'm at peace. But now I'm pregnant. I once was blind, but now I see. Was abused, but now I'm loved. Was afraid, but now I sing. Was sick, but now I'm cancer free. i
people groups sing about that amazing love and grace. And it is a reminder to us uh, that your love is as far reaching as the ends of the earth and beyond. That your gracious offer is for every person of every age, in every age of every race and culture. And we are blessed to know you. And Lord, I pray for our nation today and ask uh, once again for your healing touch of mercy and that you would uh, go far beyond our imaginations uh, to bring back together this people as one nation under God. 
we lift again to you the victims in Haiti and in Afghanistan and pray, Father, your continued hand of protection and provision for them. And I pray, uh, oh God, for uh, those who are uh, in uh, need of physical touch in our church family, dealing especially with health issues. And I pray for those, Lord, who are in emotional need this morning. I pray for marriages that are hurting and parent-child relationships that are strained. And I pray that your amazing love would be the healer today in our hearts. I pray that we would be open to your truth uh, as you uh, minister to our hearts today. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, ladies, all girls today. All girls today. Oh, boy. <laughs> all right. Good morning, everybody. Glad to see you today. And uh, what a wonderful uh, sense of God's presence in this place. Amen. Amen. So we've been answering the question, can God be measured? And in order to measure God, we have looked at some of his characteristics. And, and I've been taking opposites. The first week we talked about God's weakness and why that's important to us. And the next week we went the opposite way and talked about God's power. The last week we looked at God's generosity. And uh, to tell you the truth, I thought about a, an opposite of that. And I, I really can't come up with a word that means what I want it to mean. Um, I found some antonyms, cheapness, closeness, meanness, miserliness, selfishness, stinginess. But none of those really emphasize what I believe um, is possibly the most significant way that we can measure God. So I've chosen a word that still doesn't really say it, but here it is, exclusive. God is exclusive. Now, he is inclusive in his offer of salvation, but he is exclusive in the reality of salvation. In other words, everybody's invited, but not everybody says yes. Therefore, not everybody can come. You must say yes to the gracious offer of God in order to see him. But I'm not really even talking about that. And there is another word, I, I, I've hesitated to use it, uh, but we're going to talk about it today. This is really it. That God is a jealous God. It's a, it's a word that, if we use that in context with who God is and how we measure Him, uh, it's greatly misunderstood. But, but here's the scripture in Exodus chapter 20. It's Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words. By the way, you understand when God speaks, He does so with authority. And when God said, let there be light, you know what happened? There was light. And uh, when God said, let us make man in our image, what happened? Uh, the, the Trinity made man. All right? So. And God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. This is God's word. Uh, the New Living Translation uh, reads uh, in, in that particular sentence, For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection of any other gods. 
And you say, well, I don't worship any gods, but, you know, any, any other gods but God. Really? Uh, you may not have any idols laying around your house that you worship, um, but anything that we put before God, put ahead of God, any, any time that God is not highest priority in our life, whatever's at the top is what we worship. That's our idol. Um, and so a lot of people, even a lot of Christians, are guilty of having other gods to fit alongside the true and living God. Uh, by the way, that last section, that, that last part, the message reads, but I am unswervingly loyal to the thousands who love me and keep my commandments. And so I punish to the third and fourth generation. But I bless, uh, I take care of, I am unswervingly loyal to those who love me and follow my commands. Well, there are more than a hundred Bible verses that speak specifically to God's jealousy. So it's vital that we understand what it means. And, and that's kind of where we're headed this morning. Well, that is where we're headed this morning. Um, it, it's important to understand that this word jealous, uh, it, it, how, how it's used in these verses that we read in Exodus 20 uh, to, dis, to describe uh, God. Um, it's, it's different from how we speak of the sin of jealousy. See, there are two different ways that the word is used. In Galatians 5.20, uh, Paul makes it clear that jealousy is a sin. And so you say, well, it, it, if jealousy is a sin and God is jealous, then isn't God breaking his own commandment? Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, when we use the word jealous, we use it in, in the sense of being envious of someone who has something that we want. Or something that we don't have. Uh, and, and so a person might be jealous or, or envious of another person because that person has a nice home or a nice car or, or a great job or nice clothes or uh, a, an ability or skill that you wish you had. And so when you desire to have something that belongs to someone else, it's a sin. But in these verses, God isn't desiring to have something that belongs to someone else. He's desiring to have something that belongs to Him. And that is our worship and our honor. And so, no, He is not sinning. He demands what is rightfully His. Uh, if, if in these verses, God's talking to people about making idols and, and bowing down and worshiping those idols instead of giving God the worship that belongs to Him. And God is possessive in that way. He demands to have what is rightfully His. Um, here's, a, here's an example, a, a practical example that might help us to, to get an even better hold on it. Um, when I flirt with my wife, there's nothing wrong with that. When you flirt with my wife, you're sinning, according to Scripture. Why? Because she doesn't belong to you, she belongs to me. By the blessing of God, we stood before God and witnesses and vowed and gave ourselves to each other. And by that sense of the word, of the, of the idea, she is mine, and I am hers. And when you want something that doesn't belong to you, it's a sin. When you are jealous or envious, envious means not just I want something like you have, it's I want what you have. And so I'm kind of flattered when, you know, my children say, Dad, I hope I, I find a, a wife as good for me as your wife is for you. I like that. But if somebody comes up to me and says, 
I wish I had your wife. No, no, no. We're going to fight over that one. <laughs> uh, so you see what I mean? God is jealous for you. You belong to Him. He created you. And He, he gave Himself for you. You were bought with a price. You belong to Him. And so He is jealous for you. Rightly jealous. And also rightly jealous when we worship and praise and honor and adore other idols or other gods in our life. So that's what it means. He is a jealous God, but in a really good way for you. That's what it means. Um, how does it apply to us? That's not the second one. Why is it important? Uh, because God can't give Himself, all of Himself, to us unless we've unlocked all the doors and windows of our life to Him. In other words, unless we've given Him complete access to every area of our life. And here's the reason. If you are withholding an area of your life from God, He can't get in there and bless you. He can't get into that area of your life and give you what He wants to give you. Therefore, you don't have all of God because you are hoarding part of your life for yourself. Let me share with you another example. Embarrassingly, he said. <laughs> when I was a junior in high school, I'd been dating a girl for 10 months. She had attended a high school across town. Uh, and her best friend attended the high school that I attended which I never really gave too much thought about until the night of our junior-senior prom. And, uh, you know, that was back in the day when I, I know girls were trying to look extra beautiful, but they don't look like themselves anymore. You know, and they, they you know, the, the girl I was dating had, had nice dark hair down to her shoulders. And I went to pick her up for the prom, and it was way up here, all twirled together, and I thought, I'm not having my picture made with that. <laughs> Just not doing that. And um, so after the prom, uh, I was taking her home, and she said, can we stop by the bowling alley? I have some friends over there, and, and uh, could we just stop and say hey to them? I said, sure, that, that's fine. So uh, we went in, she said hey to her friends. We went back out in the car and I drove her on home and, and got to the door. I walked her all the way up to the door, didn't go in. And as I was turning to leave, she said, by the way, have fun with Pat. Pat was the girl I was going to pick up at this point. She was my second date for prom. <laughs> and Pat and I went to her church for a lock-in an all-night lock-in with her youth group, their youth group. And, uh, well, I lost the first girl immediately, lost the second girl within a month, and was left with nobody. And the problem is I was trying to give part of myself to one and part of myself to the other and ended up losing all the way around. that help you understand that when when you are uh, well let's look at it in, in the form of marriage if you are uh, not you if someone is having a, a affair outside of marriage you can't give yourself complete that person can't give themselves completely to either the wife or the mistress right and, and so when you are Worshiping other gods, when you are worshiping idols or other things in your life besides God, He can't give Himself completely to you. Because part of yourself belongs to another. Do you get it? 
you can have your cake and eat it too, but it's got to be one cake. Right? Um, well, I was thinking about this, and, and uh, I, I think I'm going to go ahead and throw this in. This was a kind of a, a parenthetical thought uh, that I hope will help us because one, one reason, I guess, that we don't give ourselves completely to God is because we're afraid. Maybe we're afraid of total commitment to Christ. I, I, I'm not sure what all the reasons would be. I, I've got a list uh, of about 25 I'm not going to read those. I decided to leave that part out. Um, but reasons that, that people um, don't fully commit themselves to Christ. But our tendency is to buck authority. Uh, um, we're embedded with the resentment when we are told what to do and how to do it. And what we can say and where we can go. And, and so this translates into the church. And reasons that people don't faithfully attend church... Or, or actually embrace the Christian faith, um, it offends some people. Uh, some of the excuses are that they're all hypocrites in the church. They only ask for money all the time. You know, and you've heard some of that. And, and again, there are a host of reasons. Um, but I think one of the key reasons is that pe people see organized religion as a as a code of rules and regulations that must be followed. And I was looking in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and uh, look, at, look at these words, listen to these words. This is where uh, the, the Shema is called uh, in the Jewish religion. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and with all your strength. That is, or the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. All right? That's called the Shema. It's a, it's a, a prayer and a demand. In that same little passage, uh, he says, These commands that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads and write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. Uh, and so this idea was actually taken literally in Bible times. And in fact, it still is today in Jewish culture. Tie them as symbols and bind them on your foreheads. And, and that's how some people feel when they think about Christian faith or the Christian religion. It's just a bunch of rules, and they tie me down. They rob me of my freedom to be who I am and who I want to be. Um, and, and so in the Jewish culture, they literally tie God's word to their bodies and, and with winding straps uh, around their arms. I have a couple of pictures just to show you. Uh, this is called tefillin. Uh, and these are the two um, apparati, uh, instruments. Uh, uh, that's, what they, that's what they look like. They're made of, of animal skin. Uh, everything about it is made of animal skin. And um, it's a, there's a whole ritual to go through about how to put it on, how to take it off when to wear it. It even has to be inspected from time to time uh, by uh, a church leader, um, a bishop. I think they have bishops uh, that, that do that. Uh, anyway, in case there's wear and tear and, the, and it needs to be replaced, all right? Here's a picture of the inside. Um, <clears throat> the one on the left, um, all right, I've, I've just forgotten. Anyway, one, one is specifically for the arm and one is specifically for the head. But as you can see on the, the lower photos, these are parchments. Again, they're made of animal skin and on these parchments are Hebrew scriptures. The, the Shema is one of them. I believe it's the one that goes in the, uh, the one on the left. <clears throat> and, and so they are put in there and sealed and now here's a, a picture of a, a couple of people wearing them. And you can see 
Uh, one is strapped to the head and one is strapped to the arm that's wound around the arm and down around the fingers. And so they are literally bound. The Word of God is literally bound to them. And uh, it, depending on the, uh, the particular um, Jewish culture, uh, some, don't, some only require men to do this or only allow men to do this. Others do include women. And as I understand primarily, um, these are worn during morning worship, afternoon worship, and during uh, morning prayer times. And, and again, there's a, it begins as soon as you touch the thing. I mean, there's a certain way you, you wrap it. Certain, in fact, you put it on your least dominant hand. If you're right-handed, you will put this on your left arm. All right? Um, but the crazy thing is, this, this doesn't bind them, it frees them. The Word of God, the grace of God, the total commitment to Christ does not bind you and imprison you. It frees you to be everything that God wants you to be and enables you to be. Um, in, in Christ, God bound Himself to us. He said, never, ever will I leave you or forsake you. And even though we've forsaken God, even though we've taken our own path, uh, we've pursued our own pleasures and, and is determined to become our own person, God remains faithful to His covenant, even though you and I might not. And so that's why this is important to give yourself completely to God so that God can give himself completely to you. It's not binding at all. It is free. And, and the final question we like to ask and answer, what does it mean to us today? How can I use this? God wants the very best for you. And, and he longs to pour his blessings on your life. Everything he has is yours. Everything he has is yours. Every attribute of God is perfect, eternal, and every attribute of God benefits you. And the more you relinquish to him, the greater blessing from God you will receive. I know that sounds like a paradox in our culture today, but it's the truth. God isn't holding out on you. Until you give in. He's not withholding anything. You know what the real problem of all this is? It's you. It's us. Because we can't receive all that God wants to give us. Because we are holding out on Him. And we must empty ourselves of our own desires and ambitions and pleasures in order to have a place for everything that God wants to give us. I just, I mean, it makes complete sense to me. It didn't when I was young. It didn't when I was first a Christian. But now it does. God wants to fill me with His holy presence. But if there's something in me that's taking up space that doesn't belong to God, He can't fill that part. And so it's like me having a glass of water up here. And if I put a rock in the bottom of the glass and fill the, the glass with water all the way to the brim, it's still not full of water. Because that rock is in the way. That rock is, it represents the things that you and I keep from God because either we think He can't handle it or we're not ready to let go of it. And, and again, that's our human nature. We want to be in control. But you know that feeling of sliding on ice in your car? <laughs> Where you feel so helpless and no matter what you do, it doesn't help? That's life. And that's why, um, was it Leanne Rhymes who said, Jesus, take the wheel. <laughs> I can't drive on ice. I'm not any good. But you can. And so I give, Lord, the will of my life to you. 
I must empty myself of my own desires and ambitions and pleasures in order to make room for everything that God wants to give me. By the way, did I tell you that everything belongs to God and that everything that belongs to God is available to us? He wants to give us. Why would I want to take up space in my life with something that is godless? Why would I want to do that? Well, that's the good news. God is a jealous God. He's jealous for you because He wants to give you the very best that He can. It's been a while since I've shared the baloney story with you. And so uh, I wanted to close with that this morning. This is from my friend Bob Benson. You've heard me read several of his writings over the years. Do you remember when they had old-fashioned Sunday school picnics? As I recall, it was back in the olden days, as my kids would say, back before they had air conditioning. And they said, we'll all meet at Sycamore Lodge in Shelby Park at 4.30 on Saturday. You bring your supper and we'll furnish the iced tea. But if you were like me, you came home at the last minute. When you were ready to pack your picnic, all you could find in the refrigerator was one dried up piece of bologna and just enough mustard in the bottom of the jar that you got it all over your knuckles trying to get to it. And just two slices of stale bread to go with it. So you made your bologna sandwich and wrapped it in an old brown bag and went to the picnic. And when it came time to eat, you sat at the end of a table and spread your bologna sandwich out. But the folks who sat next to you brought a feast. The lady was a good cook and she had worked hard all day to get ready for the picnic and she had, boy, this is gonna hurt you guys because I know it's nearing lunchtime. She had fried chicken and baked beans and potato salad and homemade rolls and sliced tomatoes and pickles and olives and celery and two big homemade chocolate pies to top it off. And that's what they spread out there next to you while you sat with your bologna sandwich. But they said to you, why don't we just put it all together? No, I couldn't do that. I couldn't even think of that, you murmured in embarrassment with one eye on that chicken. <laughs> oh, come on, there's plenty of chicken and plenty of pie and plenty of everything, and we just love bologna sandwiches. <laughs> Let's just put it all together. And so you did, and there you sat, eating like a king when you came like a pauper. And one day it dawned on me that God had been saying just this sort of thing to me. Why don't you take what you have and what you are, and I'll take what I have and what I am, and we'll just share it together. And I began to see that when I put what I had and was and am and hope to be with what he is, I stumbled upon the bargain of a lifetime. 2 Peter 1.4 reads, You may come to share in the very being of God. And so I get to thinking sometimes, thinking of me sharing with God, and, and when I think of how little I bring and how much He brings and invites me to share, I know that I should be shouting from the housetops, but I am so filled with awe and wonder that I can hardly speak. And I know that I have enough love and faith, excuse me, I know that I don't have enough love and faith or grace or mercy or wisdom, but he does. Amen. He has all those things in abundance and he says, let's just put it all together. Consecration, denial, sacrifice, total commitment, crosses, these were all hard words for me until I saw them in light of sharing in the very being of God. It isn't just a case of me kicking in what I have because God's the biggest kid in the neighborhood and he wants it all for himself. 
He's saying everything that I possess is available to you. And everything that I am and can be to a person, I will be to you. And when I think about it like that, it really amuses me to see somebody running along through life, hanging on to their dumb bag with that stale bologna sandwich in it saying, God's not going to get my sandwich. No, sir, this is mine. Did you ever see anybody like that? So needy, just about half starved to death, yet hanging on for dear life. It's not that God needs your bologna sandwich. The fact is you need his chicken. So go ahead. Eat your bologna sandwich as long as you can. But when you can't stand its tastelessness and drabness any longer, when you get so tired of running your own life by yourself and doing it your way and figuring out all the answers with no one to help, when you try to accumulate, hold, grasp, and keep everything together in your own strength and it gets to be too big a load, when you begin to realize that by yourself you're never going to be able to fulfill your dreams, I hope you'll remember that it doesn't have to be that way. You have been invited to something better, you know. You've been invited to share in the very being of God. You need his chicken. I don't care how good you are, how talented you are, how much money you have. If you haven't given everything to him, something's missing in your life. And so of all of the ways that we could measure God, I think this is the most significant. That he is a jealous God and he's jealous for you. And he demands all of your worship. Why? Because that's the only way he can give you everything that he wants to give you all of himself. Would you stand? Father, this morning I thank you for your promise that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. And we're told time and time again through Scripture how you only want the very best. And what you have, everything you have, everything that's available to you, Everything that you own, it is excellent and praiseworthy and is available to us. Our part is total consecration, complete commitment to your will and to your way. And Lord, I pray that for anyone here in this room, anyone listening, watching, worshiping with us online, who's trying to make do with the bologna sandwich of their life, would you give them the confidence and trust in you that you only want what's best for us? And anything you give us is the very best that we could ever have. And so bring us to the place in our faith that we can truly say, all that I am, all that I have, all that I desire to be, it all belongs to God. And as part of your prayer this morning, we're going to sing a little commitment song. Would you dare to sing it? Would you dare to sing this to God? I give all my service to you. I give all my service to you. No matter the cost or what others do, I give all Would you raise your palms open to him and receive from him? 
Father, for your marvelous gifts, for your amazing grace. May we walk day to day knowing that you are the giver of all good things in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. God bless you, folks. Appreciate you being here today. Good to see you. Hope you have a lovely afternoon, and we'll see you next time.